now. Okay. Hope everyone is having a wonderful day today. Can begin. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first of our online conversations about academic ontologies, hosted by the International Institute for Asian Studies under its Humanities Across Borders and Fellowship programs titled Storytelling as Research Strategy. My name is Joaquin Lapuz, and I am the Web Content Coordinator for the Humanities Across Borders program. So uh, I will be talking a little bit about the schedule. So um, our speakers will be speaking for 39 minutes, and then they'll have a 15 minute discussion amongst themselves, after which we will open the floor up to our lovely participants here. If you have any questions during this lecture, please type them in the chat field and we will address them during the Q&A portion at the end. Please note your questions, but only transcribe them once the chat is enabled. So uh, you should not be able to send messages at the moment. So once that is open, then you can input your questions. And in the interest of time, as we only have 13 minutes for the Q&A portion, we request that you type your questions in a focused and brief manner that addresses the table as a whole. And then lastly, remember to add your current location in the chat along with your question. So now to talk about the Humanities Across Borders program and this online platform for academic ontologies, I would like to introduce the academic director of the Humanities Across Borders program at IAS, Arti Kaulura, to say a few words. Arti, please take it away. Thank you, Joaquin, uh, and hello, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome everyone to this much-awaited online conversation series of the Humanities Across Borders program. HAB is a network of scholars and institutions interested in working together to create open spaces for collaborative and contextualized modes of research and teaching. The university with its dominant model of knowledge production developed by the West and reproduced in the global South confines scholars and scholarship within a normative framework that is far removed from their own experiences of local, national, and regional realities. The pandemic has exposed the contradictions and inequities of this higher education project at multiple levels and has made this conversation even more urgent. Academic ontologies, the theme of this conversation series, was conceived together with Laura Erba, our fellowship program coordinator. We are inspired by this fellowship space for quiet study, reflection, and collaboration provided by IAS, which in many ways is an in-between space for scholars, in between a PhD thesis and a book publication, in between jobs or stages in their careers. One that, nev that nevertheless provides opportunities to meet others to share among other things, this sense of in-betweenness. Quite simply, we want to invite and curate conversations that inquire into the ways in which we think, act, and relate within academia as peers, as students, as educators, as administrators, and as social actors and agents, and how we can make meaning from our common quest for this knowledge. Now, I will invite Laura to tell us more about the first session of this series on storytelling as a research strategy and to lead us to the three speaker speakers in conversation at this table. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Arti and Joaquin. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you for attending this first session. So my name is Laura Erber. Uh, I am the IAS Fellowship Program Coordinator. This is a program that uh, annually hosts a number of postdoc researchers from all over the world, especially from Asia, working in the humanities and social sciences. 
Uh, one of the challenges of this program is to create a provisional community of researchers uh, able to share and to discuss their concerns about the academic culture in which they are inserted and where they have been trained. So this specific session seeks to respond to one of these concerns, shedding light on a subject that is often little addressed or underestimated somehow. So the idea of the session is to discuss the value and uses of storytelling in academic research practices from different uh, perspectives. Storytelling here is of course understood in a broad and open sense and it will allow us to turn our attention to the specificity of the language in which research is embodied and transmitted. So our speakers will also address the experience of non-English language use in different contexts such as in the classroom, in community-based projects, or in the ethnographer's field. Our wider aim is to create an open and dynamic space for the coming together of an, an interdisciplinary community of scholars sharing intersectional, multilingual, narrative research, and teaching strategies for the next generation of scholarship. It's my pleasure now to invite uh, um, our speakers, um, starting with Elena Burgos Martinez. After her, uh, we will have Tiffany Cohn coming in, and finally, Rohit Negi. I kindly ask the table uh, speakers to introduce yourselves and to tell us where you are um, speaking or connecting from. Thank you very much, and welcome, Elena. Thank you, Laura. And thank you everyone. Can you hear me? This is a classic question to begin with. You can hear me, yes. So um, I'm Elena Burgos Martinez. Um, usually I'm based in um, at Leiden University, the Department of um, Area Studies, Asia and Middle Eastern Studies in the School of Southeast Asian Studies. Um, but all my life I've been jumping from one discipline to the next. So for me, everything from teaching to research is interdisciplinary. And um, I look at environmental politics um, in a variety of places, but I'm currently in Yogyakarta, in Java, in Indonesia. And um, this is the capital of the performative arts. This is the capital of the, the political arts as well. It's a great place to be now and um, here. And I'm currently in a very small school in the outskirts of Yogyakarta, in a classroom that is made of bamboo, wood, and, and a few other uh, materials very interesting materials. And, uh, and what I'm doing here, I'm learning a bit about the articles of the Quran that relate to environmental knowledge and human environment relations in Bahas, Indonesia, in, in, not in Arabic, but in Bahas, Indonesia. And, um, and it's important for, for my research. So, so usually I look at um, how places that are perceived as small uh, conceptualize human environment relations, but also crisis, uh, toxicity, things like toxicity, um, crisis itself and um, and the ways in which they do that collectively. So most of my research has been research has been in Indonesia, and I arrived here. I'm going to start with stories already. I'm going to start telling you stories already. Um, I arrived here um, in 1998 um, as a young geologist. Um, yeah, very naive, and um, to study Merapi, the volcano that is uh, close to Yogyakarta, and uh, and quickly. I experienced one of the first epistemological transitions of my life. I think, well, there must have been before also, but, but that was one of the most obvious in a sense that working with scientists and at the same time trying to work with, with healers and local guardians of the volcano um, was very challenging in a way. So I realized how much certain knowledges overpower. They function as a sort of white noise, right? That, that obscure all the knowledges uh, on sites places like, like volcanoes, islands as well. But there's, there's another place in Indonesia further east, and I'm going there later in July, in which I've lived for years uh, to do research. So the type of research I do requires that I live in a place as a, as a foreigner, as a stranger, and, uh, and become familiar with, with, um, with the place and with people and everyday life. And uh, one of the places that have in has inspired my research uh, for the longest, for about 10 years or more, um, it's a, an island that is perceived as small, but let me show you. Why would you want me to tell you when you can see it yourself? Um, let me see if I can share. Can you see it? Yes, can you see the slides? Yeah. 
Yes, yes, we can. Yes, sorry. So I'm going to play a clip, and this is a clip of um, me arriving to the island on a public boat um, from the harbor of Manado. This island is in the north uh, of Sulawesi. So Sulawesi is an island that is further east than Java in Indonesia. It's in between Java and Maluku, Kalimantan and Maluku. Um, and, um, and this is where I lived for years to do what I call critical ethnographic research, which I will explain soon, but just listen. Uh, mm -hmm. Wait. Sorry about that. It doesn't let me, oh yeah, sorry, here. Now let's try this. Yes. That is a church and that is a mosque. The white uh, building is a church, the, the green yellow is a mosque. So essentially, this is a place that you can still hear me, right? Yes, this is a place that has inspired um, a lot of my research and, um, and a lot of the transitions that I went through as a researcher, trying to, to work with, in conversation with, conversation is a word that is really important. So, so this is why I'm very thankful to, to Artie and Laura, I forgot to say that at the beginning, for inviting me to this conversation. So conversations are really important. And one thing that academia needs is epistemic diversity, but also beyond that, ontologic uh, diversity, ep onto epistemologic diversity, we could say. And, um, and as researchers who are foreigners and who have grown up in countries with a colonial history as, as colonizer, it's even more important that we constantly reflect and constantly position the type of knowledges that we are constructing, constructing within our research. We all construct knowledge, but some of these constructions carry more power than others, depending on the settings where we are. So, for example, the knowledge that we construct here, arriving to the island, might not have a lot of weight uh, on the island. But if I communicate it um, through a story, this is a reflective moment within the story, very meta. If I if I communicate it in, a, let's say, a seminar within the anthropology department, it might carry a bit more weight than one of my um, participants going to talk about it in a different language that is not English. So it depends. It always depends. So let me switch to this. Um, these are two words that I was obsessed with when I started my research. One, Takonan, is a, is a word from Bahasa Baonsama. That is the language of the, the island of uh, uh, Pulau Nail. And Mampu is a, is a word from Bahasa Indonesia. The, um, takonan means to know, and Mampu means to be able to, to be capable. And, uh, and I was obsessed with knowing. There's a, there's a, there's a journey of knowing for, for researchers and of being able to carry ethnographic research as well. And, uh, and I remember constantly, because of my background also in linguistics, I remember that I constantly look for equivalence of words. So I, I kept saying, oh, akutao, akutakona, gitu, equivalent um, from um, I know in Bahasa Indonesia, the equivalent in Baonsama, which, which, which is it? And then I remember people telling me, who cares? Why are you constantly looking about um, equivalence, about translations, literal translations? Who cares about words? What matters is the, is the meaning. If a word like Mampu from Bahasa Indonesia enters the context of Paon Sama, the language of Pulau Nain, um, that, that word is already a Paon Sama word. It doesn't matter if it's still Mampu, if you write it still like that. What, what matters is the, the meaning. So I realized that um, to respect epistemic diversity, you need to go beyond language and you need to go into semantics and you, go, you need to go into epistemic um, worlds and you need to go into ontology as well. And so in the kind of ethnography that I, that I include from which I approach research, um, I don't draw graphs of people <laughs> or ethnic groups or, or islands even. I try to look at invisible processes, even though people are included and I am myself included, invisible processes visible and invisible processes of knowledge making in conversation with um, more than human uh, entities. So things like volcanoes, as you can see in one of the photos, um, things like, I don't know, uh, typhoons, things like fish as well. I think Artie has heard me quite a lot talking about fish, but talking, in talking to fish as well. And so all of these um, agents become subjects of research. They are not objects, but they are subjects of research. So your research completely changes when you look at, at, at a fish as a subject and not an object. So normally around the islands, um, these small islands have been constructed 
from different perspectives. So you have the, the sort of developmentalist paradigm of business progress development, right? Um, in which fish are food. And then you have the paradigm, this usually comes in into the island through um, ba uh, Manaro Malayu, so Bahasa, uh, Malay language from Manaro. And then, and then you have the, the construction of the environment that talks about disasters and talks about conservation. That comes with Bahasa Indonesia from Jakarta through programs that, that deal with that. And then you have the, the different paradigm of human environment relations of um, Baunsama, of the island, which coexist very much strong with, with these other paradigms. And, and that essentially means there's no nature. Nature is everything. The environment and the human, there's no dichotomy either. So knowledge can only be produced in conversation with different ages. And I have a, a picture that somebody took of me joining uh, prayers in Ramadan. I was invited to join it and, and I say, of course. And that's also a context in which you exchange stories, a lot of stories and, um, and knowledge as well through stories. And that is um, a place in which I heard a story. They told me, um, Elena, I heard that you want to go and, and explore a bit the caves under the island. Um, and not a lot of people go, so be careful. But if you go with this person, an elder, uh, an elder it doesn't have to be an elder. It can be a young person. Uh, with this person, particular person, you'll be safe because the cave knows their family or his family or her family. So I heard, a lot of times I heard this type of um, sentences. The fish know them. The cave knows their family. So the environment has to know you first for you to know, for you to achieve knowledge, for you to uh, to start to figure out um, what everyday life means uh, in a sense. So this is a map I made of the island. So the island is five square kilometers. It could be perceived as small, but when you stretch and you include social movement, environmental movement, um, all together and different movement, move, movement of ancestors as well who live in the coral reefs and in the rocks, then the island is huge, massive, and it spans, spreads across the seas and it spreads, if you look at history, even further than that. So it spreads across to Maluku, but also to Java even, and, uh, and, and a few other places, and not only through trade and family. I mean, islanders uh, of a small island in Indonesia and beyond Indonesia have been essentialized as having connections across seas, only in terms of trade, only in terms of family, marriage and, and stuff. But there's much more than that. There's intellectual troubles as well. And there's, and there's a lot of exchange of, of knowledge in between. So so I, I, so the island is already shifting. The, the sort of paradigms that I brought to the island, this conservation and disaster narrative, uh, or this developmentalist narrative already scrapped out of the, the research design. And, and then essentially a researcher goes to, to a place to learn, essentially. It doesn't matter who you are. You go to learn. And to learn, you have to enter the places of knowledge. And to enter the places of knowledge, you have to understand how knowledge works, how, how it is co-produced, by whom, in what situations. And, um, and the stories are very important in that sense, because the stories give you the chance to enter. So it's not only that I hear stories, but I give my own stories. So I share stories of my conversations with Merapi when I failed, betrayed Merapi's knowledge through the scientific knowledge that I brought to the, the area, that foreign form of knowledge, and I imposed it in a way with the team of uh, scientists. So people thought, okay, so Elena has already faced this kind of um, this kind of transformation, small transformation that continues throughout, throughout life till the end of life. So she might be ready to 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 give us something, and then and then you give back. So research has to be reciprocal. If it's not reciprocal. I don't know. I mean, this is within qualitative, inductive, um, ethnogra so-called ethnographic research. And um, and it's through all these stories, my conversations with Merapi, the fact that the, the cave knows their family, the fact that um, I was told also one day by Baba Haji Kasmin, who already dies, um, watching the sunset, he told me, Elena, you keep asking for our answers, but you bring your own questions. So the stories are always the points of reflection, of transition and of departure away from from paradigms and epistemologies that don't fit epistemology don't they don't work that at the same time might coexist with with the epistemologies of Bahasa Indonesia or the epistemologies of, of Bahasa Malayu um but are also diverse and, and different so you might end up working in research with a place that has a lot of different epistemologies and ontologies and it's interesting stories can give you windows vignettes vessels to connect and, and access some of these knowledge or the surface of some of these. No, you can also renegotiate power relations. I come here as a, as a to learn. I don't know. 
things. I've already rejected my previous um, sort of epistemology, so I'm also learning. I don't know everything. So sometimes researchers come in, in positions of power. We are always in positions of power, but we come in with this very strict um, framework. Um, and then through stories, when I talk about stories and I, and I share some of the stories in the classroom, usually I talk about these stories at moments of in which you stop, reflect, and then revise your framework, including methods, research questions, and then redesign inquiry. So that at least this type of knowledge joins at the point of inquiry, even though it's, it's not at the beginning, but later on in a way. And um, and this is essentially this is a, a big quote from Foucault, of course, which which is in a way a joke to criticize this this obsession in academia with quoting a French philosopher or a European philosopher, let's say, or an Anglophone philosopher um, to legitimize the knowledges of a place afar. And there's an obsession with that in uh, in anthropology, and their favorite seems to be Foucault most of the time. Then I like this quote, though I love this quote. But so essentially, Foucault here you can read it. I'll give you a few seconds to read it. So essentially, sorry if I interrupt, essentially uh, Foucault talks about, about this binary of landed sea, ocean, terra firma, and reason, and madness. And um, one thing that you learn through um, through storytelling in your own in your own everyday life research, by, by telling your own stories, by listening to stories, by considering stories, and, and including stories as, as points of departure and transition, is to challenge binaries and dichotomies, that dichotomies like reason and and rational and non-rational, reason and non-reason, but also like dichotomies like nature and culture, human and nature, human, non-human, non all of these dichotomies don't really, don't really hold. And, um, and then you prioritize vernaculars. Vernaculars not only in the sense of languages, but also the semantics behind things like the environment knows you first, that's how you acquire knowledge. Things like, for example, these, this category that I have here, this kind of, no, no category, this is not a category, this kind of um, title to address people, mbo, suggests that that person is neutral, doesn't have a gender. So when you achieve a certain status in, in Bajo society, and the status doesn't have to do with age always, you might lose your gender as well. So gender is also a construct that uh, works differently in different places. So through Bahasa Indonesia and this construction of human environment relations as, as a threat, nature is a threat and you are at the expense of that. And then you need technologies from afar to, to help you. Um, that narrative, imposes a certain gender construct with it as well, a binary gender construct. This is something that we can talk about later because it's very deep into my, my research. But then at the same time, Bahasa Baunsama doesn't have that contract and it coexists in the same island. And then the narrative of uh, development also has this binary construct. So, so do you start reading places? The stories are also points of um, transition in which you start rereading the place in a different way. So you re-enter the place. Through the story, you re-enter your research uh, location from a different angle, from a different perspective, from a different physically even, not just um, epistemologically as well. Um, I don't wanna talk too much. So essentially a strategies, I, I want to briefly talk about the strategies of um, storytelling in research and also the challenges, and then I can leave it there. So as I said before, you center vernaculars, you have to center um, ways of conceptualizing relations in the world and identity and everyday life. Um, in your research, if you're interested in that. And um, there's a tendency to say that storytelling is inclusive of all voices. I'm not sure to what point that is true, actually, because it's very dependent on the languages that the storyteller or the story collector or the story um, lover speaks or doesn't speak. Um, but storytelling usually represents when it's, it's practiced by, by communities, at least in, in, in Nine Island and, and Islands Around, is never an activity that somebody does on a pedestal and then people listen below. It's a collective conversation. It has to be a collective conversation. Storytelling doesn't exist in a unilinear uh, form. It happens daily, it happens around the island and it has particular spots that you have to figure out and follow to, to get to hear the whole story. So the story might begin in the Jerek, in the in the well. Jerek is a long summer word and it might end in another part, in the mosque or somewhere else, you know. So a stories are embodied, they move and you have to, to, to kind of earn the, the the way of joining it and, and stuff. So so storytelling has always been 
offered as an alternative to extractivist research, in which a researcher that is completely dislocated or uh, disconnected from a, from a place comes and extracts data and then uses um, everyday stories even to illustrate their points and the theories. But uh, stories for me in, the, in themselves are, are points of theorizing. Uh, stories theorize life and relations in the world. So uh, stories are theory in their own right. And but the stories as well are points of reflection and, and points of transition for the researchers. So there's the different ways of approaching. I don't know exactly if um, if storytelling can also be definitely extractivist. So it depends on how much you reflect and it depends on how much you consider vernaculars as well. And um, the challenges of storytelling is whether storytelling always follows a sort of decolonial ethics in which you don't tell stories about people or for people or on behalf of people, but you tell stories about your own research, you tell stories you've heard in a general collective way, and um, and you tell stories with people, you make stories with people, you co-create stories with people, which is something that, that eventually I did um, on the island. And uh, because it, it highly depends whether storytelling is anti-extractivist or not, or, or joins unconsciously even uh, extractivism, extractivist research, it depends who tells a story, on who tells a story, for whom, not only the languages, but the meaning behind whether translations are respectful of the epistemic realities and ontologic experiences, and um, and for whom are we telling them? That's something that I worry a lot. Am I telling these stories for my students in the European classroom, which is very useful for them to learn a bit about different human environment relations and, and conceptualizing those? But am I only telling stories for them? So for in my case, which is very different from, from the other speakers, but in my case, working with stories in research to then bring them to the classroom is very useful but there has to be more than that right engage with the community also the work community also um, has been overused uh, in a way what does that mean really but but um eventually towards the Elena? end do I see, yes i'm, I'm very on. sorry one uh, second yes yeah uh, yes for the sake of time uh, yes to wrap it up yes. soon thank you yes no I'm, I'm finishing already this is two slides left the colonial ethics i already uh, spoke about so so this is a, an example of um something that goes beyond research strategies and goes beyond bringing stories to the classroom for moments of reflexivity and positionality for the students to learn but um but by the end of the my stay on the island for two years um we were co kind of co-creating stories every day as we sang, <laughs> as we shower and sang, so we so we we were living in houses, tompas, houses on, on top of the water, and um, and then one person starts with baling teampula babu, and then the other person joins from the other house, penu alibaro, and and then blah 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 blah, and then you have a kind of sort of poem song that you have sung together, and essentially this is Imao Sama in the language of the island, and it means we are here on the island, we are all together, so we, if we are together, the island exists. Um, if you leave the island, the island is invisible, disappears. So this speaks a bit ab uh, about knowledge. If we are together collectively co-constructing from positions of reflexivity and respect, epistemic respect, ontological respect, things exist and can be, can be seen in their own terms. But if we move away from that, then you might be presenting something that is visible to you, but is invisible uh, in, in its reality, in, in its essence. Um, in a way, sorry for the abstract ending. And my, my my questions for the speakers later, we can discuss this, is whether the storytelling really ascribes to the colonial ethics, whether they have also experienced some challenges in the, to that regard. But, um, and this sentence here um, in Bahasa Indonesia talks about what I said at the beginning, that it doesn't matter what, what word, if it enters um, the meanings of Baunsama, that word is a Baunsama word. So it's more about semantics than, than lexicon and than vocabulary in a way. So I'll just leave it there with, with a nice picture of food on the island. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Okay, thank you very much, Elena. So I think, Rohit, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, we can. Yes. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Elena, for such a rich um, discussion. It was sparking a lot of questions as you were speaking. Um, so just very quickly, my name is uh, Tiffany Cohn. I'm actually originally from uh, New Zealand. Uh, I'm currently in uh, the Middle East, so I'm in the UAE in the Gulf uh, right now, uh, working at Zayed University. So very quickly, my three research areas are psychological anthropology, um, visual anthropology, and higher education and pedagogy. So I'm very interested in thinking critically and deeply about how we how we teach right, and why we teach and all the strategies used um, to teach. So I'm just going to share some slides here and try to try to speak to this um, in the time that we have. So if I just press 
play. Let me just see if I can close my screen for a second. Okay. All right. So I'm assuming people can see this, see this screen. Um, so essentially, I want to talk about here two points. The first is I want to describe some multimodal forms of representation or storytelling uh, within anthropology. So specifically verbatim theater, visual ethnography, and ethnographic poetry. And I do this really as a reminder that they should be taken seriously as forms of knowledge making. So challenging the still very strong hegemony of the formal academic written word and in, in the way that we represent uh, knowledge. And then relatedly, I want to discuss um, some, some of my own research that sought to challenge monolingual English theory building in the academy by way of a translation uh, exercise um, that I carried out with the class where we took French derived theory and translated it into languages from Asia and Africa and then back into English. So I just want to uh, discuss that as well. So I just wanted to begin by pointing to a text that I'm sure many people here are familiar with. Um, because in anthropology, it was certainly a very seminal moment in terms of thinking critically about representation um, in anthropology. So this text, Writing Culture, Poetics and Politics of Ethnography, uh, raised some really important questions, I think, about cultural representation uh, within anthropology that are still relevant today. I think we still have to ask ourselves these questions. So what role does writing play in the processes of developing anthropological knowledge? Um, or knowledge about the other, right, in a general sense? How can anthropology reimagine itself in terms of different kinds of expression? So visual, audible, sensory, or different kinds of literary genre. So fictional writing, poetic writing, dialogic writing. And so I think we know that since the 1980s, anthropology has really, has, and has diversified, right, in terms of modes of representation, but the English language is still very much hegemonic, as is the formal academic writing style that's required of serious ethnographic accounts. Um, so here I just want to offer some examples of some of these diverse modes of representation or forms of storytelling as a reminder of their potentiality as research strategies. So I'll just reference the work of two anthropologists and also of myself. So for me, I really think about literary anthropology in two senses. So one, one form of this is the study of different kinds of literary genres across cultures. Um, so for example, looking at oral storytelling practices in Amazonian communities. And the other is um, the study of the nature of anthropology itself. So I'm just checking the chat window here. Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, the other is the study of the nature of anthropology itself as a discipline and how knowledge can be represented in different written forms, so ethnographic poetry. So to speak really simply about this, ethnographic poetry is essentially the writing up of ethnographic knowledge, experience, memory, and feeling in poetic form. And it can often be a really powerful way of capturing the ambivalences and affective dimensions of ethnographic experience and knowledge. And I just want to share here an example um, of, uh, of ethnographic poetry from a recent award winner named Darcy Alexandra. So she published this in the Society for Humanistic Anthropology. And in the poem, she's talking about her experience of walking along the Sonoran border, which is US-Mexico border, which is a site that's witnessed profound violence, right? Crimes against humanity. And so she writes that the poem provides both an act of recognition and a strategy to represent violence in a way that shelters the experience of the storyteller. Following Berger's lead, I envision poetry as a form of accompaniment. So the poem is much longer than this, but just for the sake of illustration, I've just shared a, a certain stanza from the poem. So it's called Memorial. She says, I remember the color circles like paint drops and not a young woman sobbing inside a young man's arms, cabinets torn from the shoulders of the room, typewriters dragged to the floor, one single phone jack pulled from its socket, military boot prints, that color in circles like paint drops and not. Someone, maybe it is the young woman, tells me, take a photo. So we can, of course, come back to that um, in the later discussion, but I'll just move, keep moving on. So the other example I wanted to mention is performance ethnography. Um, so performance ethnography is, 
I think, really effective at allowing for multi-sensorial and embodied expressions of ethnographic knowledge. So verbatim theatre is a form of performance ethnography in which plays are constructed from the precise words of your ethnographic data. So from the precise words that were spoken by people that you interviewed. So some of you may know of the anthropologist uh, Dwight Conkergood, and he used this mode of representation quite often to bring voices of, of the marginalized to a wide variety of audiences. And he made this really interesting comment. He said that in doing so, he believed that one must not make the silly distinction between writing and living. It is the performance that defines human interaction and becomes the mode by which we can now experience and intervene in the world. So for me, when I read this, um, I really understand this as him challenging the default status of written language as somehow objective and outside of life itself. Writing, he argued, was just as much of a subjective performance as was living or the art of living. So both writing and living are performances. The final example I just wanted to mention here is visual ethnography. So in visual ethnography, um, you're integrating and using images in a variety of ways to communicate meaning, so both moving and still images. So you've got images as writing, which is the sort of early traditional use of photographs to illustrate your written data. You've got found images, which is the data that you find in the field, so the, the photographs that a participant might share with you. And then the creative use of images, so these are more reflexive, creative, collaborative approaches, um, so such as photo elicitation, where you might interpret the meaning of images together with your fellow researchers, um, or you might actually make images together with participants, so make collaborative films together, make collaborative drawings and maps, so on and so forth. So in my own work in visual ethnography, it tends to focus on ethnographic and observational film, and I use it to try to capture the nature of daily life with as little intervention as possible. So very minimal editing and no use of voiceover or music. Um, and that's just a, that's a, a video clip um, to the right from a, a film from 2016 that I made in Bangladesh um, about a Baal um, singer and philosopher named Bimal, Bimal Baal. And so the other, okay, thank you, Joaquin, five minutes. So the other example I wanted to talk about is the monolingual um, nature um, of, of theory. So in addition to multimodal approaches to representation, many scholars have also challenged the very Eurocentric and colonial nature of curricula and research methodologies. Um, and more specifically, they've challenged the fact that the social theories that inform research strategies are often taught in English and predominantly reflect structures of thought from Western intellectual history, which is a point that's been brought up um, already. So this is the context in which I conducted a project at the Asian University for Women in Bangladesh that tried to challenge this dominant model by way of proposing a multilingual approach to the building of social theory. So just to speak very briefly about this, in this project, I gave an undergraduate class of 20 students two exercises. So the first exercise asks the students to translate Borgia's concepts of habitus, cultural capital, and cultural field into their own native language. And we looked at the original French and then how it was translated to English, and they took the English and translated that. So I asked them to reflect on whether or not there were any differences between the understood or accepted meanings of these concepts and the, meaning, the meanings of the words that are chosen as equivalents. So I asked them, and finally I asked them if these new terms impacted Bourdieu's original theory in any way. And then the second exercise extended on that first um, by asking students to think of metaphors, images, and concepts within their native languages that could be used to generate new social theory related to structure and agency. So were there any images, image metaphors, right, that, that could speak to this idea of structure and agency and how they connected to each other? So just for the sake of time, I'll just give you an example here. Um, the student here was three minutes. Okay, so just the student here um, offered these definitions of cultural field, cultural capital, and habitus. So she said that cultural field refers to the ways of leading, ruling, doing, exercising responsibilities and rights of an individual that make him or her act a certain way in a particular setting. And I thought what was interesting with the student is that we, she was quite self-reflexive in how the Wolof, the Wolof cultural context 
brought a different lens, right, to the understanding of this term. So she said the wall of definition has the sense of power, structure, and responsibility present in the English definition, but it also adds the rights a person has in addition to the duties. It also puts emphasis on interactions in a space and in relationships to people. And down here, she says um, that translating the concepts created by Bourdieu and Wolof gives these concepts a sense of personal interaction. The Wolof translation shows us how the system behind the language structure puts an emphasis on a sense of belonging to a certain community and shared upheld values. So there is, yeah, there's more to say about this study, obviously, but just to give you a sense of some of the insights that have emerged out of it. So just some concluding sort of queries from me. So ethnographic poetry, visual ethnography, performance ethnography, they all offer alternative forms of representation that to varying degrees, I think, better capture or communicate or elucidate the affective, the ambivalent, the incongruent nature of human experience. Like what Elena was saying, how epistemic storytelling is good at highlighting the epistemic slippages or gaps. Um, but despite the proliferation and the development since the 1980s, there's still very much marginalized forms, I would say, of knowledge within the boundaries of an academy that has historically, and I think again today, prioritized much more positivistic knowledge production. And perhaps the current push for interdisciplinarity within higher education, in some parts of the world at least, will allow for arts-based approaches to still find their place, right, as, a, as another viewpoint. Um, and just a final question about multilingual theory building. I think it offers a really interesting way of challenging the monolingual English theory building of the academy, but it also has its own challenges. One minute. Okay, Joaquin, thank you. Um, so, for example, given the gloto politics of higher education, how could we encourage the legitimation of social theory originating in languages and storytelling from the global south. So to point back to what Elena was saying, the fact that we're constantly citing European scholars and there's sort of a legitimization that happens in, when we do that, right, that act um, of citing. So how can we further contribute to reversing that, that process of legitimation, if, if you will, of knowledge and power, that connection between knowledge and power? Okay, I will stop my screen share there. And Rohit, you can go from there. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Um, just a second. Thanks, um, Elena, as well, for the previous presentation and, uh, and HAB IHS for organizing uh, today's session. Uh, I am going to try to share. Let me just make it full screen here. Yeah. So, um, so basically, I'm arriving at today's uh, discussion from a sort of uh, at a strange moment uh, 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 because, uh, uh, first of all, but just to introduce myself, uh, I am Rohit. I'm at Ambedkar University in Delhi. Uh, my background is in urban studies, geography, urban planning. Um, and uh, but what over the last few years I've been uh, uh, able to do here and participate is in something called uh, the Center for Community Knowledge at Ambedkar University, uh, where I'm the director right now for the last two and a half years. So the moment that I spoke of or I hinted earlier is basically this: the following, that the field of urban studies, where uh, uh, I do most of my uh, you know research and uh, and writing. Uh, is is although it's not really as professional driven as planning per se, but still there is a very strong uh, uh, sort of positivist lineage in the in the, in the field uh, in terms of what counts as 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 stories, what doesn't, what counts as legitimate knowledge, and what doesn't, and so on. And in fact, one of my very good friends recently shared with me. Uh, a note he got from an editor where his paper was actually rejected by the editor. And it said that the rejection was because the paper did not uh, have a decisive theoretical contribution. And actually that phrase has stuck with me for a little bit. I've been thinking about it, uh, of what decisive theoretical contribution means. It's obviously loaded, it's obviously subjective, it's obviously historical. And what it leads me to think is 
because there is this sort of hurdle or this kind of ways through which you have to get your stuff out there uh there is all kinds of incentives to write in a formulaic manner to engage in all certain kinds of you know uh, signaling over deeper engagement richer description uh there is also disincentive therefore to tell stories in the in the sense of storytelling right which is the use of imagination and creativity to draw af affective responses and so there is no surprise then that we are at this moment where uh, uh, uh these questions are are very relevant and so i'm glad for this discussion to uh, take place right now now the other why i said there's a moment of dilemma because the other side to it is in my in the last few years i've been working uh with with actually scientists in uh and around delhi region to who who study write about talk about and uh, intervene in the toxic air in the air pollution of the region and one of the things i've realized over these years is that scientists are really thinking about storytelling at the moment they are very interested in it they realize that the the more or better quote and what better knowledge we have of uh, uh this issue this tricky problem of air pollution doesn't necessarily uh, translate into action and how people understand it and how they mobilize it and how it uh, goes from niche sort of study subject to something that has a wider currency right and so they are interested in that translation that tiffany talked about but in a different way translation of scientific knowledge into popular idioms uh into popular stories uh and so on and i think this is where uh, uh, uh a lot of what we collectively can achieve as social scientists and humanities scholars potentially holds uh, some use uh, but to get there the way i was thinking about this this provocation for today is to actually think through publics of what uh, uh, that we engage with right as folks located uh, broadly speaking within an academic community there is that ep epistemic community or discipline the interdisciplinary area that uh, as the case might be then there is the student body uh, for those of us who are located in universities and colleges uh, a large part of our work involves these interactions so where is storytelling there and third of course with the wider world so i've already said a little bit about academia when discussing urban studies but in general i do feel and as tiffany also signaled there is there is increasing space increasing room for different kinds of methods and forms of expression today visual anthropology but also other disciplines uh, and fields there's more space for you to publish to uh, be heard and seen uh, with these kinds of methodologies uh but there is always a question of rigor you have to sort of redefine it you have to think through you have to redefine as the case might be you know for instance uh, a lot of people who do oral history research they are in an ongoing um, sometimes battle sometimes negotiation with history uh, those of us located in those disciplines as to whether the knowledge that is being produced through these methods is valid uh, can be accepted by the wider community or not right so that is one part of this discussion that uh, a lot of us are engaged in the other that i also want to bring in uh, uh, is and already uh, tiffany has done it a little bit is the pedagogical aspect that is classroom and storytelling and the plays of storytelling in the classroom what i've realized while in the last few years actually we've uh, personally myself and with few colleagues we've had this opportunity to actually develop a new school to develop new programs and courses and one of the things that we have been constantly thinking about is where the universe first of all the classroom and then the university is located within young people and in their worlds uh, we realize very often in many circumstances we are not really uh, the priority of young people and the kind of then what they do in the classroom then becomes just a different an alternate universe for them that they must navigate for the sake of good grades but it's not necessarily something that they enjoy being part of or that even makes sense with the kind of lives that they are living elsewhere so how do we then develop or work with new other genres of courses materials and assessments that are more closely linked to the world that 
young people inhabit today right so i'm thinking for instance uh, so some of our courses have been designed with this in mind they're still you know we are still working through them trying to understand what works what doesn't but there's a course called you know electoral systems for instance where elections which you know every year that the course is offered there is some big election going on somewhere or the other there was municipal election in delhi last year delhi elections previously indian election american election so we said why don't we build a course develop a course that actually works around actual elections that are going on somewhere and then you go into meanings of democracy constitution uh, uh, histories of electoral systems uh the uh, inequalities and injustices and all those kinds of things materials uh what 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 is you know do we necessarily uh, while we do want students to have access and understand canons in thought uh, uh what about other kinds of materials what about indigenous knowledges and so on that has been discussed by lena as well where do the fine space was in curricula uh curricula often take longer to change than even this uh, uh uh research and writing assessments uh again the kinds of uh, uh, uh examination that we have are so disconnected from how we are answering important questions of our lives for instance you know uh, for instance uh, uh we, are, we are experimenting with having students prepare films and memes and all kinds of things uh just to just to see how that maybe that brings more of them into uh, uh more of their you know thought space into uh, uh, uh the university now the third thing which is more engaging with the uh, outside world and especially with communities uh, around where we are so uh so what now i'll just give few 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 instances of the kind of work i've been doing with the, the center that the center for community knowledge uh and also previously so uh this is ethnographic film is something i see as extremely valuable it you can publish you can uh, write for an academic audience uh, uh i don't know uh, i mean it has obviously it has it, it's important but at the same time the reach that uh, uh, even a, a film not you know award winning film but a film nonetheless that is on youtube may have that gets certain complex points but across in a simpler way in a different and more accessible way may have broader reach uh then uh again these are all actual uh, these are all research projects through which where we have these brought in other ways of uh, storytelling so photographic documentation uh so for instance there's a project uh, which the previous film and this one is are both part of relates to changes in built environments in the himalayan region and uh, and one of the things we've done is is documenting through photographic uh, uh, visuals and uh, and uh, one of uh, the researchers had also brought out a book on the same right so it brings in a, a, a different way to just have your material or have your sort of representation of particular reality there in different forms uh, for different audiences and so on um what we have also done is to to actually bring or to see research because it is co produced but also co what to call it uh, uh co visualized in a sense and uh uh what we have done through the center is a number of what we call neighborhood museums that is uh, research that is done with a particular community we uh, uh, uh it's not necessarily even produced or done for the sake of academic publications but for a uh, uh, further community engagement so uh, these neighborhood museums sort of become the space where we can bring in different generations together around certain displays or provocations that we have uh, displayed uh, and some of this work then we have also tried to bring out in the form of publications for popular audiences bilingual publications this one that we have are just about designing and should be published soon comes out of this other uh, uh, actually this very village uh, in the borders of delhi uh, on the southwest borders of delhi where uh, we tell the story of the village through oral history research but in the form of a children's book uh, illustrated children's book that uh, our goal is ultimately to to have uh, uh, the you know people in the uh, uh, rural belt of delhi uh have some sort of documentation and some you know just just some means for for them to talk and discuss and engage with their own realities so 
this was another example of uh, what we had done uh, that is a student a uh, master student in our university she had done her under, uh, master's dissertation work with afghan communities of delhi and then we told her you know why don't you spend time with us with the center uh, further work on your project and ultimately with the help of designers and so on we got this book out which is essentially a, a primer on the communities afghan communities and it's organized in the way the following way that is these are 25 words that have some meaning hold some meaning for the community that they would want us to know about so each uh, uh, sort of two page panel which has a you know a little bit of text but also imagery and uh, an artwork so sort of expands on these different uh, uh, words in this in this book um so just to now uh, since i think i have what two minutes three minutes one minute left yeah so i'll just conclude with this uh, 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 with this slide that i think and these are more practical kinds of uh, 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 things that i have come to appreciate is that when you do write project grants uh, think of other kinds of output also rather than simply the academic outputs right uh, and budget them in films or books don't get produced to made uh, uh, for free right so budget them in uh, engage those who are better placed than you to work on these things collaborate with artists collaborate with uh, filmmakers but you have to create space uh, right when you're planning for these kinds of things the second thing i will say here is uh, community engagement not as an afterthought that is okay now that we've done our research what do we do with our material but as something that you build in from the beginning from the very start so very from the planning stage uh even the when we are generating our questions we have to think over what makes sense in a particular place a locality uh what situated forms of knowledge is might hold some meaning there value there uh and uh, might also be useful to the community you know obviously the community also with, uh, is divided so i'm just but i'm using it in a you know essentialized sense right now uh then you, do we have enough space within our universities for these kinds of experiments uh whether they are whether they be courses or materials or uh, uh uh or these kinds of engagements and this is unfortunately we don't have a lot of space this we are lucky that uh, someone had the foresight to create the center 11 years back at our university that we have inherited in a sense uh which has space and opportunity uh and i think what we've been trying to do is to just be a place where let's say uh, where students primarily students they uh can just hang around for a while right they rather than just seeing the university as a place you come and get your degree and leave our emphasis is for students or those at least who are interested to just be around to work with your own research your own material and maybe think about some creative ways you can uh, 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 work with your material and your uh, and your the knowledge that you produced in your phd's or mphil's or mas and so on uh, so but it's not easy to sustain this uh, there are always pressures of course of rating agencies and so on students hanging about uh, and sl doesn't get you points there but uh, uh, but it, i feel it's very important for students to have that that space comfortable space in the university to experiment to fail sometimes but also possibly produce some very interesting things uh, and then of course uh, already been pointed out that ethics of representation representations obviously are are anything but uh, 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 linear or unproblematic um, and i think one of the key things here is to sustain relationships and uh, therefore rather than uh expanding into too many directions uh personally i've tried to have you know a couple of places where i've been working on and just see them as long term engagements uh rather than as project i mean the good thing is i don't have i haven't gotten many projects so uh that is i haven't got much money from external sources so uh, uh so i'm not in uh, so it's a double freedom as marx called it uh so freedom from constraints of uh, grant agencies uh which gives you more more freedom i suppose so um so in a sense i'll i'll stop there uh and uh, there are some notes i've made on other presentations that i can you know share other ideas later thanks 
Thank you very much, uh, Rohit. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank the three of you for these uh, inspiring talks and also for bringing in like very different perspectives uh, on storytelling uses. Uh, so before we move on to the conversation, <laughs> I just would like maybe to anchor the the I mean the the conversation you you have like uh, around our main question. Some yeah, I mean you you have been also approaching so how storytelling can be brought to our academic agenda and how also paying attention to storytelling dimension can help unravel the question of language politics and linguistic hegemony that all researchers must deal with so and I, maybe i would like just to mean uh, recall elena's also question so in which way storytelling can challenge extractivist research also just not to mystify or romanticize storytelling per se, uh, or to approach it as a kind of a salvation to the power uh, knowledge relations, but also the the idea uh, brought uh, by Rohit and Tiffany around, uh, uh, I think, the translation of scientific knowledge into popular stories. So how other fields that are known maybe for being more strict are maybe more open than the humanities and social sciences for storytelling methodologies, I mean, at, at a certain point. And I think from the three talks, just uh, last uh, comment, like we see that there is a lot of diversity in like social sciences and humanities methodologies and also incorporating storytelling. But still, when it comes to publishing articles and academic books, it's still we are facing a very conservative uh, approach to knowledge. And there is a gap. Uh, I mean, I think this is very clear from your from your talks. So I invite now the speakers again to to uh, jump in and to the floor. So you have like 15 minutes and after that we will open for questions and answers and for those who want to who want to send questions we ask that all the questions be addressed to the whole group so and not to individual speakers. Thank you very much. Well, I think my immediate thought in response to your um your prompt, your, your very helpful comment, Laura, was to comes back to something that you said, Elena, about how st I think you were saying how storytelling can open up the sort of ontological e epistemological diversity or epistemic diversity. Um, <clears throat> and it allows us, and I can relate to that and what I was saying in that storytelling of different kinds, right, using poetry and theater and um, the, the storytelling of film. Um, allows us to access different dimensions of experiences, those slippages between the sort of typologies of, you know, the way we might quanti try to quantify or, yeah, experience. It um, it allows for us that the ambivalence and the affective embodied dimensions of experience, I think. So those were some, yeah, just some immediate connecting points. So I think that is really the power of storytelling and all the beautiful diverse forms that it that it manifests can offer um, knowledge production. No, definitely. And and um, and storytelling is very much an, an embodied uh, experience, uh, whether you are listening to stories or whether you're telling your own research stories or whether you are um, including stories after the breaks in the classroom to reflect on knowledge that you have introduced and, and, and will explain later as well. And ask the students also to um, to find stories that, that, that turn the tables for them, also epistemologically, that, that, that really give them a, a space to breathe and to to perceive in a different way that is not as positive as, as you have noted as well. But I, sorry to jump in with my own experiences again, but um, I'm all the way here for that. But I'm extremely uncomfortable very often. My classroom is a European classroom, so it's a bit different from, from other classrooms. But... I have very lovely students, very interesting students who are mostly taking very positivist programs with a couple of courses who are which are not so positivist. So a storytelling is important. A storytelling should be part of the curriculum. That's something that the, the uh, Rohi said. But is the space? How does it work when 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 a course centers on storytelling, but the rest of the program continues with positivist um, approaches and you know imbalances? Of knowledge and absences that they're heavy, and um, 
so the students come with all their good intention, openness, and and, and etc. And, and the European classroom is to an extent um, international and is diversifying in terms of gender, but in terms of class and, and race, is not following as fast. In that sense, so so it's complicated to jump to to, to arrive with in, within, for example, a political ecology course or an ecofeminism course, and uh, and share a story and then engage with the students finding stories, translating. I really love Tiffany's uh, translation exorcism. <laughs> it was great. Um, translate, retranslate, and, and reflect uh, uh, about processes. But the moment they exit that classroom, you know, we, we inhabit the, the, a very constrained space in which you are allowed to do these courses because there's a sense, this is me now, conspiracy theories, but there's a sense that it won't go fast, far. And it, it won't go anywhere really. This is just anecdotes. I've got a lot of comments like that. Oh, yeah, Elena, this is really interesting, but it's just anecdotes, right? So how do you substantiate your research? What is the sample size? And I'm like, being a geologist um, as my first um, degree, bachelor degree, I can definitely respond in, in different ways, but it's just infuriating that um, we can't seem to exit those. And it doesn't have to be in the classroom. It also applies to research. So you enter a, a research so-called field that is always subjugated to the, the academe where the theory is produced. So there's always already this imbalance in the sense of knowledge uh, co-creation and um, that it doesn't happen there, it happens at the, at the university. And, and even if you revert that in a sense, um, after, where does it go? After you exit, that sort of space that you, that you have co-constructed um, of collaboration, does it go anywhere? Even if you organize, events and, and invite people to talk and then you translate because they don't speak English. But English is gonna is so hegemonic. Francophone, Anglophone spaces, they're, they're so hegemonic. Yeah, sorry, I'm talking too, too long. Uh, Rohit, what do you think? No, yeah, these are, uh, um, and these are difficult questions, obviously. Uh, actually, I was also interested in uh, um, something else that you said, Elena, which you can come in later uh, about uh, uh, to expand on which you said the stories allow you or stories are windows if I heard it correctly into other sort of ontologies uh, uh, that I found quite interesting because uh, if you know and then how do we translate that point or that idea about the possibilities of storytelling into then research or even classroom and teaching right so uh, uh, that's something maybe perhaps you can you can come in later. But actually, just uh, on the on the on the thing that uh, Laura mentioned earlier, which is uh, uh, translation as an, as 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 an act that, uh, like I mentioned, scientists are recognizing that as, as important. So one of the things that uh, for a while I was advising uh, was actually a project by an artist collective in Delhi, uh, where they had put out a call. Uh, two artists uh, of South Asia to respond to this, the air pollution uh, the question. And, uh, and I mean, they were not sure as to where they, it would go. So they were also sort of apprehensive because this is the first time they were doing something like this, right? Where something that generally is uh, sort of a scientific uh, uh, domain, uh, how do artists make sense of it and so on. But ultimately after uh, three or four years when uh, the artists had produced their uh, sort of works, it became, uh, it, it became clear that there were, there were multiple different ways in which they had imagined it. And uh, each of them led us to different kinds of uh, uh, questions and different experiences, right? So for instance, one artist, she uh, 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 created an entire scripted uh, play. Uh, it was really a tribunal uh, on air pollution. Uh, and on the one hand, there was one, uh, a set of artists uh, who, who basically created a, uh, what can I say, how do we put it? A sort of sarcastic, uh, a humorous take on uh, real estate brochures, uh, basically selling us, you know, clean air and nice. Uh, living, but with all the kind of ironies built into that of class, uh, community, and and sort of splintering of cities and so on. Um, so, so I found that to be interesting, and uh, and 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 here uh, there is some possibility, there is some opening that I hinted at earlier, 
uh, in terms of uh, scientists sort of recognizing the importance of storytelling, although they are coming at it from a very particular, even instrumentalist uh, 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 sort of observation or motivation. That is, you know, we have all these great data, wonderful, sophisticated data. No one seems to care. Uh, and then they highlight or they have arrived at uh, translation and storytelling as that uh, practice through which it can be done. So it's, I mean, but but once they recognize it, that's when we can also engage in a conversation with them about okay, what the 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 that the way that they are imagining it is doesn't really it doesn't work like that, uh, um, and so on. Um, yeah, that was just something I uh, uh, remembered off the top of my head. Tiffany, do you want to come? In? Uh, yeah. So both both comments about the the sort of tension right of teaching a qualitative course within the broader structural context that's focused more on quantitative and then speaking the language of science to the language of the arts sort of tension as well and that that tension that you're both speaking of was was partly why i mentioned um the the word interdisciplinarity and i know there are lots of debates around this term and what it means and what impact it has on disciplinarity so on and so forth um but i think it, one particular way of thinking into interdisciplinary uh, in an interdisciplinary nary way um, would I I see it as potentially offering a way of approaching a topic where in the classroom you can allow the students to say okay this is climate change and we're going to look at it from um, the perspective of a filmmaker the perspective of a scientist the perspective of a mathematician you know and it's a way of them seeing different forms of knowledge side by side and then reconciling right <clears throat> reconciling the differences reconciling the different values that each of those forms of knowledge and forms of representation bring to each other um so i mean as as you know again there are lots of questions with it as an approach but i think there is value in helping the students, you know, sit these forms of knowledge alongside each other and help them to see um, the importance of that. So not to silo, silo their own thinking and think, okay, I'm going to a writing class now, I'm going to a film class, I'm now going to an environmental studies class, but actually to present the information in a way to them that enables them to see the conversation right between them. So. So Rohit, thinking if they become, say a student becomes a scientist in the future years, they can think back and say, oh, actually, you know, science communication is a really important field and I can bring these two together. And yeah, that, that's just what it made me think of. of um, no, definitely, but the, the, the issue with, uh, sorry to jump in, the issue with, um, with that, like, for example, having a course that, in, oh, sorry, that includes the, um, includes poetry, includes performance, includes um, political statements, includes science, so-called science, meaning earth sciences or or uh, hard sciences, is that that happens, at least in my context, my, my teaching context, that happens in a context that has already, it has a particular academic culture that is a legacy of colonization and that construct this idea of objectivity that is so much based on hegemons, power imbalances, and, and particular epistemologies that are not alone in the world, but have claimed the space. They are the narrator, basically, of the so-called environmental story, for example. And the mm. rest is additions, appendices, performative attempts. It's not how we feel it, obviously, but the space is a problem that we inhabit spaces physically, epistemologically, in so many ways that have been constructed for some to succeed and some to never make it and, and, and go beyond. So the, one of the elements, the notion of objectivity, there's also the notion of what else? I can't think now of any other, but there's many notions there getting on the yeah, way. No, hmm. I, abs I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. I think I'm talking in a sort of ideal, ideal world <laughs> in one sense where, and even in, the, in that sort of classroom where you don't just have one person teaching all of that, you have mm. a team of people mm. teaching to one topic, but they're all offering a different perspective and having an actual dialogue with each other. I feel like that would be a very, very fruitful way to yeah. approach. But again, I am talking in an ideal world that is outside of the political yeah, nature of these spaces as well. Yeah. I think the, the key also and is something that Artie and Laura practice themselves a lot, and some of my colleagues who are here, Yossi and Daniela as well, is taking the class outside of the class. 
So the class transcends the, the, the boundaries of the, the, the physical and epistemic boundaries of the, the building and the, and the place and, and connecting to, to some of the other epistemic spaces around the university that are so paramount for you know, existing and, and surviving and, and approaching environmental crisis as well in my context. So if the class exists, then objectivity is renegotiated at times, not always, but... That yeah, no, something. I agree. Yeah, no, I agree. Just a very quick comment. I was thinking sometimes this disjuncture and sort of um, discomfort I feel when I'm telling students about ethnographic work or you're showing photographs or you're showing video, right? And it's also, it's so distant and so abstract from, it's a very visceral experience, but when you present it to people, it just sort of becomes so distilled and so um, distant. And I find it hard to actually have people engage with that material because they're so saturated, right? So saturated with media, I mean. So it's, yeah, so I, I, I like that idea of taking them out of sort of a demarcated space, teaching a class outside in the garden, beside the ocean, you know, in a community of people where the students are actually getting a sense of what it is to be with other people, you know, in a deeper sense. Not even teaching, like just going somewhere. Sorry, Rohit. Rohi, oh, no, no, no. I was just, I was just going to jump in on this and just share uh, very briefly one of the kinds of, so personally, myself having come from, uh, or made this journey from uh, this highly quote-unquote professional field of urban planning to more humanities, uh, social science uh, sort of world, uh, but I do feel that uh, and have felt for a while that th th there is something that is there at, if, at the intersection of these two and, and uh, uh, design, I'm thinking more design fields and then human humanities. And one of the things that we have built into our program is something called the studio, which obviously is not new. I mean, anyone who's trained in architecture or city planning, so on, or urban design will know that studios are part of your uh, primary part of your curriculum. Uh, but in humanity, social, we don't have any, any of that. So, and our programs are art, master of arts, they are social science. But we have brought in studio and sort of trying to work with a more humanistic sort of ways through which a studio can work, where we bring in that iterative mode of the design studio, that is this interaction with the world, outside with particular place, right? More deeper interactions with the place. Uh, 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 this circling back and forth from these spaces and so on. But at the same time, imbue them with uh, uh, meaning and different ways of expression so that ultimately we are not constraining what we learn uh, with, you know, just a series of dry suggestions that planning studios end with, right? So that is something that we are, we, we've been trying to do. Uh, it's still only been a few years. I think if once we have given it enough time, uh, we can, we can, we will be in a better place to, to share as to what works, what doesn't and so on, yeah. And now we would like to open the conversation to the participants of our call. So for our participants, you should be able to input chat messages and so in the interest of time, as we only have a few minutes, uh, we request that you type your questions in a focused and brief manner that addresses the table as a whole, and to remember to add your current location in the chat along with your question. So yes, please feel free to send in your questions and we will read them out to our lovely speakers. It can also be comments or, or anything you feel like sharing. It looks like we don't have uh, we don't have so many comments as yet, but I just wanted to thank uh, uh, the three of you for really invigorating uh, this question that we've had about in between spaces. Uh, what I was speaking about and what IAS and Humanities Across Borders program. And each one of you have kind of alluded to that these spaces which allow us to be within the academic world, but also engage with the world and society outside. And, and it's a question of interpretation, representation, um, self-knowledge uh, as well. 
Uh, and that's why I think this academic ontologies uh, uh, series that Lara and I uh, and IAS has created through this platform, uh, I think it's very important. And, and somehow I feel I wanted to let you know that we uh, we kind of messed up for our Latin American and US and African participants because of the time. And I almost feel like this is a moment where we need to have this conversation almost again for this group of people, you know, because it's another hemisphere. Uh, and um, uh, so, yeah, I want to really thank you very much for really being part of this uh, to sort of uh, opening this question, which I think needs to also continue. And we can't just let it go with this conversation. So is there, are there any questions, Laura? Just uh, to see. No, I uh, had, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I just wanted maybe, maybe that uh, about the uh, storytelling itself, itself. We, we have been like, of course, from, from storytelling, we went, went to several, I mean, other uh, dimensions of, I uh, mean, academia and, uh, uh, but just to go back, I mean, from where do you get inspiration from? And, uh, and this is always a story we tell about our own, like, uh, connection with our research, because also I think what, you have been telling is also how to reconnect with theoretical knowledge with the knowledge making in a more like uh, we have i mean of course very well trained scholars but i mean many times uh i organize here um, an activity called inspirational session and sometimes i see that very I mean very I mean, bright and successful scholars but how to reconnect with i mean from where the inspiration comes from from where your interest in your own field comes from. And I think like the storytelling is also enables uh, us as researchers uh, to reconnect to our, like the core of our interests. As I just wanted you to maybe say something. Now I think we have, uh, yeah. Uh, I think now the converse, the, 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 um, the chat is open for, for the audience to bring in questions. So while you, you maybe you, you, I mean, you just comment on this. I will be uh, reading the the questions from the audience. No, perfect. And and I, I do think the, these academic ontologies conversations are a way of reclaiming the space, reclaiming the the, the ont epistemic spaces. The these platforms are a kind of liminal space. We love the word liminal in anthropology. So there you go. It's a sort of liminal space in which we can renegotiate how we do research, for whom do we do research, with whom do we you know to express. So it's reclaiming a bit the spaces that have been the spaces that have been designed for certain agencies to be exercised, but other not. So this is this, a conversation is always a point of exposure in a way. Yeah. So so I really love this this idea. Thank you so much for for organizing that. I can continue talking. If you... <laughs> so one thing, one thing yeah. that I, I, I was reflecting earlier with Rohit's comments and Tiffany's comments as well, and yours, Laura and, and Artis, of course, um, is the fact that if your inspiration comes from deep inspiration comes from volcanoes and and you know seaweed fields and fish and, and trees and people who are reclaiming their histories and powerful histories and, and agency and escape, trying to escape these developmentalist and conservationist um, constructions of their their identity. And then I'm vis revisiting these spaces of the past, but also a kind of present that has informed my my my, my research and my work in the European classroom. There's a there's a disruption there that is a bit more apparent. Uh, it's more apparent in in a, in a sense, and and this is why I think I feel uncomfortable at times telling stories. And I always fear this the the fact that they might be exoticized or essentialized, or you know that the 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 agenda on side of uh, Nine Island is to reclaim powerful histories and to be recognized as, as maritime people who have a lot of connections and networks and they're not just poor people in a small in a small island they need developing from from a from a capital. So so um how to escape these kind of perceptions and yeah. But there might be questions here and I'm just Yes, talking. now now we have questions. So um uh one question is like so in uh for the for for the whole group so in your research how did you analyze storytelling what method did you use uh this is isma from berlin i will bring in the other question we have and then you can see how you answer 
So it's a query on the methods suggested or a comment. They want to hear a comment on how to overcome translational misinterpretations and linguistic barriers while adhering to the storytelling strategy. I, if I, I'll jump in and then Rohit and, and Tiffany, I don't analyze stories. Uh, stories are not uh, objects in, in my research. They are subjects in a way they are mediums for analysis. So stories are a way of a window, like I said before, you could call it a portal or a, or a vessel, I use all of those to, to sort of re-approach knowledge production, processes of knowledge knowledge production and, and what things mean essentially. So so storytelling in my research is, no, is a method uh, for understanding knowledge production mechanisms in everyday life in a critical way or in a way that is coherent with the place, but it's not um, data that I extract or collect to analyze. So it's analysis in itself of knowledge. That, that mm. makes sense. I mean, in terms of uh, method, personally, uh, in my own research, um, it's, it's, it's essentially, I will tell you what the question is, the larger research question or the question that I start with is how are these settlements changing? You know, what's behind that? And uh, 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 how are they producing new lines of inequity or equity in some cases, uh, but also environmental risks are being that, 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 that uh, basically uh, are part of inhabiting these, these contexts not the Himalayan context, for instance. So um, one can approach the same question, the same sets of questions so many different ways. And uh, none of them is right or wrong per se. They just lead you to different places. Uh, so the, 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 the method uh, that uh, I've been working with is, is essentially biographies of, of buildings, uh, biographies of, of built environments. Uh, so you you start with you can start with any 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 particular building that's that exists and you can then go into its its story you know what was here earlier uh, 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 who used to farm slash uh, 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 worship slash whatever the case might be in this place uh, then uh, who who built what exists uh, uh, how many years did it take. Uh, um, who did they engage in building? Where was the material drawn from? Uh, uh, how did they embellish the kinds of things that they built? Have there been any improvements from the uh, the earlier or the original form? Uh, uh, who lives there now? How long have they lived? And we can go on and on, but already you can see that just starting with a bare uh, a structure uh, can get you into questions of, you know, where does the sand come from? Where does the gravel come from? Which bil which sort of hills are we hollowing out to get the sand? Uh, uh, what if we are transitioning or changing from wooden to cement RCC construction, then what about the people who had the skills to work with the wood? Uh, what are they doing now? So, and, and I found that an extremely productive uh, uh, method to just uh, start from the micro. Uh, uh, of course, like I said, micro zooming out is uh, one strategy. Uh, one could work with others, uh, and then you then you try to see if this story is also something shared across, or is it something exceptional? Uh, uh, both of those have value. Both finding rep replications, repetitions, but also uh, 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 outliers are, are ter terribly important and useful to to then uh, uh, map the story of a place. Of course, and here is the, the anxiety or the, in, the entire urgency of this conversation is that 90% of what I've found will never make it to any academic publication. Uh, even though I see a lot of it as, as having value and uh, uh, unfortunately most journal editors don't, but that's okay because we have other ways through which we can bring those stories out. And some of those that I mentioned earlier, the children's book or the uh, photographic exhibition or uh, the film and, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's just a few words on method for me. Yeah. I can see quite a few questions coming in there. I'm just going to quickly respond to the Joaquin story. Oh, yes, uh, no, I will I'll read them out. So we have two questions that are looking at uh, two questions from Cambodia that look at uh, victims of war and conflicts. And some of the questions that they've asked here are, um, what is the ethnography strategy that can help me to collect narratives effectively? How do I know that the stories I collect are 
are the true stories and how does storytelling how does storytelling work in dealing with the past? So I'll leave that all to you to answer. Tiffany, do you I mean, want to go ahead? Can, sorry, I was just going to say I don't have an answer, so you can come in, Elena. Except that I can point to one or two interesting directions that I've just uh, witnessed myself recently. Uh, so uh, on our university campus in Delhi, something called the Partition Museum has just been opened just this past month. And uh, uh, partition, of course, refers to the Indian subcontinent in the 1940s, late 1940s, and uh, and and its aftermath. Uh, but uh, uh, it's a beautifully put together place that uh, uh, you know that brings in obviously the uh, narratives and memories and artifacts of people who who intimately sort of lived through uh, that period in history, but also uh, 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 moments of sort of the thinking are established uh, uh, ways through which we understand this particular narrative. There are moments to also reconcile and some, you know, so I think these kinds of things um, might be worth for you looking at, looking at this. Yeah. Um, I can see that's Visal who's posed that question. I know you Visal, so it's nice to know that you're here. Um, thank you for that question. So I think you've said, what is the ethnography strategy that can help me to collect narratives effectively? Um, so I think ethnography is, is a strategy in itself. So in ethnography, ethnography is a way of collecting stories, right? It's a way to collect stories. And then if you choose to, to come back to an earlier question, it becomes a question of how you want to represent what form of representation are you going to use to share those stories? That's essentially... So will you use poetry? Will you use film? Will you use performance? Will you use written a written academic style, right? Will you directly quote people or will you paraphrase? These are all questions of form of representation. But I think when you say, what is the ethnographic strategy um, to collect narratives effectively, you're thinking about if, if, what is ethnography itself as a research method and you think about participant observation and you use that process to follow the stories, right? Follow the people you meet, and then you capture their stories and so on and so forth. Um, the question about truth, how do I know that stories that I've collected are the truth stories? So as I know we've talked about, this is a, um, this is, yeah, a, a bigger philosophical question, but um, you, this comes from, yeah, the question of what is true is, is a complex one, but, um, in terms of the truth that people give you, right, you are accepting that as a researcher. The longer you can spend in a community, the more you can verify, you know, the truth and cross check and talk to other people and so on and so forth. So there are ways to verify the truth. But um, yeah, the, the idea of what is true can be subjectively, yeah, debated um, as well. Um, and for Chalk, Sofat, I recognize your name as well. Rohit, sorry, do you want to jump in there? No, 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 please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, I was just reading that question, how the storytelling works on dealing with the past. Um, how can storytelling contribute to rebuilding trust and reconciliation among victims of war conflict perpetrators? So I think um, doing using a collaborative participatory research taking that approach where you as the researcher you are working in collaboration with the community that you're with I think that's a really good approach for what you're talking about if your eventual goal is to help the community rebuild right amongst themselves so you as a researcher is sort of more like a, a facility you're asking certain questions key questions that can guide them and lead them to ask themselves those questions right and then slowly over time yeah rebuild um, Rebuild reconciliation of a kind. Definitely, no. These are really difficult questions. There's no way that I can answer any of them. But, but I think connecting to what you're saying, I think taking ethnography as a sort of reflective exercise as well, in which you, rather than guiding, also are guided by by the concepts of people. So how is truth being um, defined? So that the way that you conceptualize truth tells you a lot about history as well. History is and imbalances and absences, what is truth really, and uh, and who is 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 um, allowed to to construct truth and to hold truth and 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 yeah. So so always listen to the concepts on site and challenge 
the, the concepts that you brought with you maybe if you are an outsider if you're an insider also if you're an outsider as well but share uh, storytelling is, is an exchange it's collaborative it can be one way only so so ethnography gives a bit, if critical it gives us a space a space to um renegotiate constantly relations and, and everything but yeah there's a lot of ethnography is also embedded in political contexts as well so so we need to remember the the systems that ethnography is embedded in um beyond the research and the participants and 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 the medium and, and etc but um yeah essentially um there is one question uh, from Orvashi, uh, I think from Sydney, uh, based in Sydney. So the question is, as thank you for the presentation. The question, uh, my question rather comment is in the age where the world is slowly and ironically getting to know the history of the events that have been magnanimous in the humankind, but somehow the larger world seems to be oblivious about them. In that context, how do you position yourself with respect to the dissemination or even the expression of the stories? I find myself sometimes talking to the walls. Who would like to <laughs> i'm an expert in talking to the walls also so maybe not just very briefly i'm sure that there's more interesting things to to say from the other sides but it doesn't matter i mean the walls are walls also who cares <laughs> the walls just keep talking and uh again consciousness that is achieved through reflexivity and repositioning the knowledge you're constructing yourself and whether it's collective or not whether it promotes certain autonomies and not others whether it is respective re respectful of sovereignty and self-determination of communities and 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 people who have suffered as well and um and whether you are legitimizing certain political agendas with certain narratives with certain constructions and certain um approaches and i'm drifting away mumbling now but <laughs> But I'm sure Tiffany and, and Rohit can save me. Um, I would just say that I, I can totally sympathize when you say I find myself talking sometimes to the walls. I think everybody here can sympathize to that. The sort of exhaustion you feel when you want to everyone to see something that you feel is so painfully clear. Um, but I, I think just remember that there is always an audience. There are always audiences. And you can speak in different ways to different audiences. I was thinking of an art gallery space, right, that I was in just the other day. And there are these incredible installations. And I know that requires, you know, it has its own politics, as everything does. But my point is that there are so many different interesting spaces in the world that if you feel like there is a message or a reminder that you need to share that, um, don't be discouraged. There will be an audience out there, right, that will want to listen to that message. We are your audience as well, these conversations. Mm. Yeah, I was actually going to come in on a, a different question, which uh, I found interesting, which was about um, the uh, communities, how do communities have agency in the output, etc. cetera. So, um, so like I mentioned towards the end when I was just rushing through my PowerPoint that, uh, uh, where do you see yourself with respect to the uh, uh, members of community, different uh, collectives or individuals, uh, and, and at what and at what point of time and at what different moments do you do you, do you uh, uh, plan discussions? Do you engage in discussions and work? And what I was suggesting there was that it should it should be built in from uh, 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 the very beginning from when your projects uh, are being conceptualized where you are framing questions in fact the questions have to be should be ideally driven from uh, 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 you know sometimes they are driven from political commitment sometimes from uh, what we feel is uh, some gap in academic uh, knowledge, but very often it could be something. So for instance, in this one place that we are working in, our first initial, very first conversation with people in terms of uh, uh, one of the questions you asked uh, the, the folks that were around was what, if we were to spend six months, one year, two years here, what would you want us to work on? And and it was and the conversations are weird inevitably towards water, and that whole conversation. And in fact, right now we're just finishing uh, a, a paper on water in this in this village, 
but uh, 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 and so water just has been always part of this conversation. People, in fact, are getting together, drilling hundred feet under the ground and getting water out, pumping groundwater out so that they can uh, 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 have water in their uh, tank, the pond, the village pond, basically. Obviously, this is totally, you know, it doesn't make scientific sense to, to do that because you're not getting it recharged. But on the other hand, uh, uh, it shows this kind of willingness. So people just, like, they have been writing letters to the government for years and nothing has happened, just taking charge of the situation. So maybe there is a possibility we can actually, uh, uh, I'm not an expert, quote unquote, but I do have uh, access. I do know people who, who, are, who can work with them on water, on this circumstance and making it more, uh, sort of ecologically oriented action. Perhaps that's our, 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 our a space we can connect different groups and different communities. That's one more thing. And the finally, uh, what I would say is that um, the, what I've found is that these neighborhood museums that we have had are incredibly useful. I mean, really productive, really generative view. Uh, people also sometimes are very upfront and they say, look, you've said this, this person said that, it's just, uh, you know, he doesn't know what they are talking about. Uh, there is this other story also. So rather than saying, oh, we got it wrong or anything, because we are like overjoyed and like, okay, what's your side of it? What do you think uh, happened here, right? And so these just become spaces for further conversations, for uh, even more engagement and 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 doing this kind of uh, sort of cross-checking that people have been talking about. Uh, um, so, you know, depends. We had a three-day thing because last year, because it was in the heat wave, but previous neighborhood museums have happened for like two weeks, three weeks, and so on. Uh, again, they are a massive effort, but, you know, if you have a, a set of possible collaborators who might want to work with you, uh, you, could, you, could, you could plan something. I wanted to suggest, because we might not have time, there's a very interesting question on the chat about mistranslation, and uh, maybe that could be the topic of the next conversations. I'm stepping in. Thank you, Elena. We'll keep that in mind, for sure. So, uh, Elena does have a point. So, for the sake of time, I think we will end with this final question from Sylvia, based in Rio. Uh, I, she says, I thank you for the excellent presentations and the topic of this presentation. Considering the storytelling strategy for research and knowledge production, how do we deal with the issue of digital archives and repositories that in their construction have actually produced a decontextualization of stories and narratives? Oh, definitely. I mean, let me jump in. I'm in Leiden. I'm not in Leiden now, but I'm, I'm, I'm a staff member from Leiden University. All the archives that belong here, for example, in Java are there. So the digitizing, not only digitizing, but also the, the existence of manuscripts, textiles, visual archives, and over, of everything that has been dislocated from context. Now I'm taking a bit of a different perspective, I know, but the perspective of history, the, 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 the displacement of, um, of histories um, and having to access that, that already constructs a particular power relation. In itself, like we were commenting very, very much in the past few months about how uh, oh, new new manuscripts have been digitized. New manuscripts to come, uh, Javanese manuscripts or, 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 or Maluku manuscripts, and, and to access them, you have to go to Leiden. So, so this is already um, getting on the way. So, how do you how do you work with that? Because you have to work in conversations with the archive as well, and um, and in conversations with other sources, and of course, so and digitizing. Digitizing in, in terms of languages, for example, when I have recorded um, different things and um, it was very important to include the soundscape, not just words and um, and include anything that, that that speaks of the senses and embodiment, you know, the, the, the soundscape, non-human sounds, di different things to, to understand. So digitizing can also, is moving forward in a way as well, um, to include more than just text and images. Okay. Oh, uh, sorry. I wished <laughs> I was uh, unsure if any of our other speakers wish to say anything. But if that's the case, then uh, I think we can finish up here. So.
On behalf of IAS, I would like to thank Elena, Tiffany, and Rohit for this thought-provoking lecture, uh, this discussion, this conversation, excuse me. And as a final remark, uh, I would just like to remind everyone here uh, in the call that this is the first of our conversation series on academic ontologies, the next event being planned for some time in mid-October. So I will be putting something in the chat right now. If you're interested in attending uh, this event or any of our other events, please visit our events page at IAS.Asia. So I will be putting it here. Thank you very much, everyone. And we hope that you have a wonderful day, afternoon, or evening. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you for organizing and, and mediating. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>